I'm Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The United Kingdom of Israel, Foreshadowing the Reign of Christ the King. Today we'll be talking about Lesson 24 of our study, which covers the first book of Kings, chapters 3 and 4. Where we left off, we've seen that Solomon is now acting king. He's consolidated a decent amount of his power, so he's king for real. Not just uh, by anointing, he really actually is king. Everybody seems to acknowledge that. Uh, and so now we're ready to get into what does it look like when Solomon is ruling. Um, we start off here with a couple of verses that set the stage really well for where he is and where he's going, unfortunately for him. Uh, the first thing that we see is he forms an alliance with Egypt. A uh, very astute thing politically, uh, for sure, because Egypt at the time still big country, very powerful, and he does that by marrying a daughter of the pharaoh, uh, thereby uniting the kingdoms in a sense, or at least forming a fairly strong alliance. Uh, so the pros, pretty obvious. You have Egypt as a pretty strong ally. The cons may be a little less obvious, but very worth talking about. Uh, it's not always been exactly overly encouraged for God's people to marry outside of God's people. Uh, and it has, I don't know if any of you remember why, but there's pretty traditionally one very specific reason why that's frowned upon. And that is foreign wives tend over time to lead to the practice of serving or allowing the serving of foreign gods. They tend not to worship God and God of Israel and have their own gods. And over time, that can that then corrupt religious practice can enter the people. Now, we're not saying Solomon's going to do that. He's, at this point, God-fearing man, loves his father David, wants to follow in his footsteps. No immediate problems. But at the very least, we should be waving a yellow flag when we see that happening. Maybe not red yet, but yellow probably waving a little bit. So I'm sure he can handle it, though. No problem. Uh, the other thing that happens here is we see that the people are sacrificing on the high places. Uh, again, this is yellow flag. We're not in red flag territory. Uh, why high places? This has been a thing that's happened and will continue to happen. God living in the heavens, if you want to get closer to God, you go up. So that it was a common practice throughout the region to worship gods on high places. It was a much less common practice to worship the God of Israel on high places, especially when you had the Ark of the Covenant, which was in Jerusalem. Um, so that, is this entirely kosher? Why would you worship God on high places when you could go to Jerusalem and worship God where the Ark is? Uh, yellow flag, but is it, as long as they're worshiping God on the high places, is it strictly not good? No, it's, it's a kind of a gray area, and everybody seems to be doing it. And the reason, and this anticipates and sets a theme for what we're going to see as Solomon continues to consolidate his power uh, religiously as well as politically, is of course the people need a unified place and practice of worship, uh, which they still seem not to have totally established yet. And that will be a thing that Solomon very excellently does for them. But in the absence of that, people are kind of just doing whatever seems best to them. And they need some clear leadership here. So again, sacrificing on the high places, let's not say that it's sinful by any stretch, but there's a nice yellow flag waving when we see that starting. So we're diving right in with things that are not wrong in and of themselves, 
but give us a little bit of note of caution, which is not exactly how we started David's reign. But so far, so good with Solomon. Let's see what happens from here. So, we've seen Solomon has married Pharaoh's daughter, which will come back around later maybe, but for now, people are sacrificing on the high places, and so is Solomon, we see here. He's pretty much following the statutes and practices of his father David, except that he is worshiping at the high places, specifically Gibeon. Uh, he's doing so very enthusiastically, sacrificing thousands of animals and spending a lot of time there. Solomon wants to get close to the Lord. Uh, and he's doing it the best that he knows how, although not exactly like his dad did, and maybe he could have learned a few better lessons from David, but all evidence is he's trying. Uh, and as is often the case, and we should all be thankful for it, God rewards our trying even when we don't always know exactly what we're doing, and we're not always doing things the best. God is good at knowing our intentions and responding accordingly even when we're not doing things in an optimal way which should be great comfort to all of us. Um, and that is what happens here. So Solomon, uh, worshiping on the high place, apparently got tired out and or spent the whole day there and decided to sleep over and has a dream uh, where God appears to him and they have a little bit of a chat about what does Solomon really want and need. He has been praying a lot after all, he must be after something. Uh, and Solomon starts by saying, well, my dad was great, and he knew what he was doing, and he could manage all of this, and he could handle all of this. I'm not sure I can. This is a lot, and I'm not that old, nor do I necessarily know what I'm doing. Could you help me figure out the difference between, and understand the difference between doing good things and doing bad things, so that I can do the good things, and that I can then, accordingly, correctly, correctly, I'll rule your people the way that you see fit. Very good request. Nice, humble request. We can see right now, Solomon's heart is in a great place. He's trying to serve the Lord and be a good king. So we've seen Solomon's side of his chat with God. God says, what do you want? And Solomon has very humbly uh, asked to be able for the wisdom to know good and evil uh, to better serve God and to rule his people. There's another instance in the Bible where somebody goes after being able to tell the difference between good and evil, and God does not care for it in that particular instance, which makes this an especially interesting point for contrast. And that is, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the original sin, and God is certainly displeased by it there. Uh, so it's worth contrasting what's going on here a little bit between the two so we can better understand, as we'll see, why God likes Solomon's request and does not like what Adam and Eve do. First and foremost, Adam and Eve had a rule that they were supposed to follow, which was don't eat this fruit, uh, which was pretty much the only rule they had to follow, and they still managed to break it. Uh, so they did not have God's permission. They didn't ask God, they took it upon themselves. Uh, and there was this idea floating around, thanks to the serpent uh, who was chatting with them, that if you eat it, you'll become like God. So they were attempting to take upon themselves some of the role which at the time was God's, uh, and to do it against God's express wishes. So it's maybe not knowing the difference between good and bad so much there that's the problem for them. It's that they didn't know it enough to not do bad when they only had one rule. Uh, which, if you can't get it right when you only have one rule, how well are you going to do when you know a lot more things that are wrong? And we see that starts humanity down a path that is only fixed ultimately with Jesus Christ. So, not so great there. Different thing here is God has asked Solomon, hey, what do you want? And he said, I just want to be able to tell what's good and bad so that I can rule your people better. Well, don't, doesn't humanity already know what's good and bad? After all, uh, Adam and Eve ate that fruit. So what's happened? Well, turns out that when we fall into the habit of committing sin over and over, our perception and our view gets distorted. 
and it becomes much more difficult to discern and to tell the difference between those things. And that is basically the state of the vast majority of humanity at the time of Solomon. Uh, so that even though humanity now has the capacity to have this knowledge of what is good and what is evil, it has been clouded and distorted by generations of sinful behavior. Um, and we get some of these few wonderful individuals like the prophets who seem to have the ability to pierce through that cloud of ignorance and sin and to see things uh, as God sees them and to see this is good, this is bad. But day-to-day -day people have a lot of problem with that, as maybe we still do now, possibly. I think so, yeah. Um, we have different means of trying to go about learning that now, which is growing closer to God. Uh, confession helps. Getting as much sin out of our lives as we can uh, can help us much better see well, not only what is good and what is bad, but also what God has in mind for our lives. So if you're trying to figure out where God is, is leading you, it's definitely a good start to get rid of all of the sinful things that are going on in your life. But here Solomon is just saying, I know that I don't know the best thing to do all the time, and that is what I want. Uh, very different from Adam and Eve, we want to be like God and darn the rules, uh, is instead I just want to serve God better and I can't when I don't know what's going on. So hugely different in intention, um, and it speaks to the fact that Solomon already has a great deal of wisdom if that is what he is choosing to ask for. So how does God respond? Uh, again, very favorably he says, well, you know, a lot of people would have asked for riches or long life or victory over their enemies or, you know, all these fun things that you get a wish and you're asking for the ability to do your to serve God better, not for anything for you. Kudos. Good job. Uh, I'll give you all that other stuff, too, because you had the good sense to ask for something that I want to give you. So I will give you what you asked for and more besides. Uh, so you'll get some of the riches and victory over your enemies, and you'll be the wisest person on earth. And, by the way, that other one you didn't ask for, long life, I might also give you, but for that there is something you have to do as well, which is you you get length of days if you follow my commands and statutes, uh, which is very much core to the idea of what is the covenant in the Old Testament. You have life when you don't sin, and when you sin, you die. Uh, against all of these promises, or apart from all of these promises where God can just give all of this stuff, he can't just give life without it being contingent upon good behavior. Because in the Old Covenant, echoing even in today, into today, life is contingent upon good behavior and following the law. God can't give it without the condition, because that is the fundamental law that governs human life and death. It is if you sin, you die. If you don't sin, you don't die. So, Solomon can live a very long time, but for that, he has to follow the rules. So, Solomon has just had what he would view, I'm sure, as a very favorable dream. Uh, and with that promise from God comes a renewed emphasis from his part on doing everything right because he likes what he heard and he wants to make sure that comes back, comes to pass. So, he goes back to Jerusalem. He does not stay in the high place and continue to worship and thank God. He goes back to Jerusalem before the ark uh, and begins worshiping and off, makes offerings there at the ark instead of on the high place. Uh, and he's basically saying, you could take this in a few ways. I think my favorite is he now understands that what he was just doing is wrong because God gave him the wisdom to know the difference because he asked for it. Uh, and so now he says, whoops, I should have been worshiping in Jerusalem because like, my, like my father David did, before the ark, the presence of God, and not in this high place. So let me go make that right and offer some sacrifices and say, by the way, God, remember all those things you promised. I would really like to have them, please. So Solomon has returned to Jerusalem. And with that, this little shift in emphasis here in one verse will lead to, again, we'll see how 
religious practice starts to change for the people under Solomon as king for the better, and Jerusalem will become a point of emphasis. So we have just established that Solomon has been granted a tremendous amount of wisdom by God. For the sake of narrative, it, would, it will now be very useful to see some of that in action. So we get a story where Solomon is judging a dispute, which is a thing that the kings did at the time. Uh, goes all the way back to Deuteronomy, if not before, when Moses was, ju was judging the people and there were too many cases, and so he delegated some of them to lower officials, but anything that was a real stumper still got brought to Moses. Uh, and pretty much from that time on, it's assumed that the person... It's easy for us to kind of miss how this works, because in our three-party system, somebody makes laws, somebody executes, has executive authority, and then you have a separate branch that is in charge of judging. And so for us, it would be weird to see the president judging uh, a legal dispute, because that's not how it works in this country. But back then, that is exactly how it worked, and one of the functions of the king was, you have a dispute, nobody else wants to touch this one, so I have to rule on it. Um, and so this one, whose child is this, big deal, lots at stake, looks like everybody else passed. Or they came directly to him because they didn't want to deal with anyone but Solomon. Uh, and we see Solomon employ a rather ingenious method to figure out who's the real mother. He judges right. Everybody is impressed. Uh, and we see the wisdom of Solomon in action, and he's growing famous for how much wisdom he has uh, and how well he can tell the difference between right and wrong and see almost as God sees. So good things happening, Solomon wise, good judge, everything is going great. So now as we did with David a few times, we cut to a list of Solomon's court. Some of these names are familiar, some aren't. Uh, we won't go into excessive detail about all of them, but there are a few, a couple important points to take away from this. One, look at how many of these people are related to the few people who went with Solomon to anoint him as king uh, of his dad's followers. Uh, they are extremely well represented here by their children uh, who have very cushy positions all said and done. And this is not, this is, totally expected, right? That's part of why you side with one person or another when there's a dispute about who's going to be king, is you hope that when, if your guy wins, then you'll get a nice cushy job uh, and a nice position and everything will go well for you. Um, that is kind of the expectation and surely was the expectation when people supported Solomon, even if they were doing it because they love and serve God. Uh, and let's not take away the fact that they believed he was the rightful king from their motivation, especially when there was a prophet in the group. But there is expectation of another sort of prophet as well when you do something like that. Uh, and Solomon has delivered. Uh, the other point is David had pretty much at most ever named two priests in his retinue, and Solomon has more, at least double that. Uh, so he is really stacking his cabinet here with religious figures, uh, people with religious authority. Whereas David kind of kept a little bit of that close to the chest and kind of was more of that himself. Solomon is not going to get so much into himself governing the religious side, so he calls up more priests into his group to help sort out some of that. Uh, it's very important, he wants to get it right, but he himself doesn't really want to mess with it. And so many of the people who sided with him were priests and prophets. There's a lot of room to expand that side of the cabinet. So we see way less military, way more religious when we look at Sol Sol Solomon's cabinet, which should tell us really very clearly what his agenda is in the beginning here, which is to start building, building some religious structure uh, for the people. So we've seen the cabinet. Uh, Solomon does something else that we never saw that his dad did, uh, which is he establishes something not unlike what we see in the nobility. So. He divides the land up. Different parts of the land are responsible for providing for his household and his needs for 
a month of the year. Basically, 12 groups, everybody gets a month. Uh, and over the different areas, he takes somebody and says, it's your job to make sure that I get what I need at that time uh, for your month. And the rest of the time, you can also manage that. So essentially, he has 12 more people, and in the list of names, you'll see some other people who did well by David and by Solomon, uh, more of what you would expect. Uh, they're basically governors of different regions, uh, and they help make sure the appropriate things funnel up to Solomon, and then the rest of the time, they pretty much get to do what they want. So not only are we laying the framework for building more of a uh, religious bureaucracy, but we're also spreading down in a different way some political power, which is very important with, if you consider the size of the kingdom, the king should not be trying to manage all of that. So he has effectively set up a lower tier of political authority over different areas so that he doesn't have to busy himself with the day-to-day -day and can enjoy being king a little. So here we see kind of in summary that there are a lot of people and they're listed as both Judah and Israel, which at this point seems a little weird because there's one kingdom, why would it matter? Uh, we may be anticipating a little bit, uh, but we also see the relative importance of Judah, specifically because the king is from Judah. And there's this idea going back to when David was named king in two different waves, that Judah and the rest of Israel act somewhat independently of one another. Uh, and don't always... Judah's not exactly on the Israel bandwagon, and there's been some tension between the two of them. So we're, it's fair to treat them already as two separate entities, but not to spoil anything for those of you who might not be familiar, but probably should be already at least a little bit, they're not going to stay together as one kingdom forever, and then it will be Judah and Israel. So we're also seeing a little bit of a picture here of foreshadowing that they will be two totally separate things, whereas now and for Solomon's lifetime, that won't be true. Uh, so Judah and Israel, lots of people. Look at how far the land and the kingdom spreads. It's even bigger and better than David's kingdom. Uh, isn't everything great? So, first glance, honestly, this passage looks like a little bit of a throwaway, like more of, look at how great things are going and all the stuff and land Solomon has. But there's a thing here that's very important not to have be lost, which is, early on, there were three big rules and things that are huge no-nos for the king. Uh, there are things he's not, that are not to be amassed. Uh, specifically, those things are gold, horses, and wives. So, so far, we don't see any evidence that Solomon has big piles of gold anywhere. So far, so good. Check. He has one wife. So far, so good. Check. And you know there's a little leeway there, because David had more than one wife, and nobody seemed to think that was a problem. So there's a question of how many is too many for the king. Uh, and we'll see maybe how that plays out a little bit here. But so far, so good on that front for Solomon as well. But... And again, this is in the very early days of his reign, we see he has a ton of horses and chariots. And the reason not to have horses was specifically because they're part of chariots uh, and indicate a large standing army. Uh, and so there's peace all around, which is lovely, and the theory has been proposed many times throughout history that building a huge military force allows for the continuation of peace. Um, and that is exactly what's happening, and it can even seem very wise to do that, uh, but God kind of has a rule against it. So here's our first strike with Solomon. We've got three things not to do, and we've got strike one. Uh, he has a large standing army. But in general, trying to follow God pretty well, two-thirds of the way right on those rules and doing a lot of things well. So report card, he's still, what, B plus maybe? Uh, still very much passing, but not perfect. 
So as we continue to set up what's been going on with Solomon, we just want to round back around one more time to, man, isn't this guy wise? And he wrote a lot of things, some of which are in the Bible. Uh, the book of Proverbs is attributed to him, as is sometimes the Song of Solomon, which makes a little bit of sense considering the name, although its origin is a little debatable, as is also in the same category, the book of wisdom. Uh, but at any rate, Wise guy, he did a lot of writing. Uh, some of it ended up in the Bible, and for a lot of his inspiration, he liked to talk about, think about, write about birds, trees, animals, nature, uh, suggesting that God is teaching Solomon about the reality of things through natural creation. In his wisdom, he sees in God's creation God and right and wrong. Uh, and by looking at and studying those things, he learns more about what to do. Uh, seems very philosophically inclined. Uh, and again, very wise, still being very wise. Whatever else might happen with his reign, he wrote a lot of great things that he should get a lot of credit for. This has been an overview of Lesson 24 of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, The United Kingdom of Israel, foreshadowing the reign of Christ the King. For more information, consult our written study and visit us online at turningtogodsword.com.